I could picture her sitting underneath the landline in the telephone chair. Her knees would be up by her chin because the telephone chair was child size. I could picture her smiling because I had just told her that in six months' time, she would be a great-grandmother. Now, three years before that, I'm sure she was sitting in the telephone chair when I called her and told her that I was getting married to the man I had been living with. She said, oh, sweet girl, I am so glad. I knew you weren't that kind of girl. <laughs> that kind of girl? I kind of wondered what she meant. Because her mother, my great-grandmother, Leila May, was famous for having told all of the women in her family that they needed to live with a man at least a year to know whether or not he was marriageable material. She was practicing this kind of discernment in the 1800s. That led to three children being born by three different men, <laughs> none of whom were marriageable material. So she had to put those children out for adoption. I don't know whether she lived with my great-grandfather for a year before they got married. Maybe she just didn't have good judgment, I'm not sure. But after six children, he ran off with the sweet young waitress from the family restaurant and left Leila May to raise those kids on her own. The oldest one, my Aunt Laura, had to leave school in order to help support the family. And the next to the youngest one, who was my grandmother, she ran wild. You see, she was sure that she was my great-grandfather's favorite. And she was really hurt that he didn't consult with her before he ran off with that waitress. She ran wild with a boy named Charlie who was very handsome, at least that's what my aunts told me, and kind of dangerous. They would skip school, they would smoke, drink, stay out late at night, and that was the way she coped with her dad leaving. Now, Leila May seemed completely unfazed by her husband taking off like that. She just kind of retrenched. She ran the family business, she kept a welcoming home, she used to say, did you buy the kids for the house or the house for the kids, which was the way of underscoring her philosophy that kids come first. She truly had a welcoming house. The, the kids brought friends home all the time, girlfriends, boyfriends, whatever. She used to count the feet before breakfast to know how many eggs to cook. When Leila May got her own feet underneath her, had enough of a means, money, she gathered her daughters around and she told them about those three other children. Her daughters were shocked. They were shocked, but they knew how much Leila May loved her children, and she knew that those kids must have been on Leila May's mind from the day they were born. And so they looked for them and they found them. I don't know about the oldest one because there's not a story attached to that child, but I know the second one was a boy and they met him on his front porch long enough for them to lay eyes on each other, maybe exchange names. I don't even know if they touched each other, but that was it. But the third child became my Aunt Dorothy, and she was overjoyed to find out that she had a big and raucous family in addition to her adoptive family. And my family was so overjoyed about Aunt Dorothy that they picked up roots from Syracuse where they had lived, and they moved to Detroit, Michigan, where my Aunt Dorothy lived. Now, Charlie was invited to make that move, too, but somehow or another, he never did. I guess he wasn't marriageable material. But there was a, a fallout from the fact that she spent time with Charlie, and it came not too long after I made that phone call about the baby coming, and it came in the form of a cough that just didn't sound right. We went to the doctor, and she had a malignant tumor in her lung, from all that smoking with Charlie. She went through chemotherapy and radiation, and there was another time we were sitting together talking, and the words that came out of her mouth were just gibberish. She said, I can tell by the way you're looking at me that what I said didn't make sense. She explained that when she was talking, she could hear something like popcorn going off inside of her head went to the doctor again and the, the cancer had moved from her lung and metastasized into her brain. The downward slope after that was a precipice. 
she was in the hospital, she was unable to see, unable to speak, unable to eat. And we had all gathered together in her home. In the middle of the night, I could hear the phone ringing, and I went out into the hallway and I saw my mother. She was under the landline, sitting in the telephone chair. With her knees up by her chin, she looked so vulnerable. She looked like a child. And when she looked at me, I knew that my grandmother was dead. And I thought, my mom's an orphan. My baby came just two weeks later. My mother was there with me. And I felt so connected to her. I felt connected to my mom who had given birth to me and my dear grandmother who had given birth to my mom and to my great-grandmother, Leila LeMay. Leila LeMay and my grandmother had lived adventurous lives. They had loved the men in their lives, and they had fiercely loved and protected their children. I looked at my own baby, I looked him right in the eye, and I thought, yes, Grandma, I am that kind of girl, just like you.